Hello everyone and welcome to my first video. Before I begin, I would like to add a disclaimer. This case is about a serial killer whose main targets were children. The story is not pretty. No murder is, however, those that involve children are particularly troubling. What makes the story even more disturbing is the fact that the killer was a child himself when he began fantasizing about harming children. And he would eventually begin murdering them at the age of 17. In the maternity ward of a Toronto hospital, a young teenage mother named Juanita Woodcock was being prepared to give birth to a son. The baby was destined to be a ward of the crown the moment he was born, and two social workers kept watch at the impending birth. Juanita was ill-prepared for motherhood. She was young, unmarried, and there is some evidence that she was working as a prostitute. Also, the child's father, a teenager himself, was no longer involved with Juanita and would not or could not provide for his child. This was not the only time that Juanita would give birth to a child out of wedlock, which at the time was considered to be scandalous. Four years after giving birth to her son, she found herself pregnant again and, once again, the child would be put up for adoption. While one of Juanita's children would lead a normal, uneventful life, the other would gain a reputation as a teenage serial killer. On the 5th of March, 1939, Juanita gave birth to a healthy son who she named Peter. Although the Children's Aid Society of Toronto decided that it was in the child's best interest to be removed from the care of his mother, Juanita was allowed to keep her son for a month, during which time he was breastfed. He was unable to gain weight and cried continuously. The next few months for Peter can be described as abusive. Shuffled from foster home to foster home, he encountered adults who took care of him solely for the money provided by Children's Aid Society of Toronto, or he would be physically abused. At one point, while still a baby, Peter was severely beaten by one foster parent and subsequently was hospitalized with a twisted neck. Not surprisingly, there was no bonding between the child or any of his foster parents. As such, Peter became withdrawn and began to exhibit strange behaviors. Peter's horrific experiences with the foster care program eventually ended at three years old when he was sent to live with a well-to-do couple, Frank and Susan Maynard. The Maynards had a great life of wealth, stability, and a sense of family. Their home was located in one of Toronto's best neighborhoods, and Peter wanted for nothing. Peter became very attached to Susan, and the feeling was mutual. Even though the bonding was one that was comparable to that of mother and son, it was at times chaotic. Peter's foster mother, Susan, was a controlling figure who doted on her son, perhaps because of psychological trauma due to past abuse in foster homes, Peter disliked being around strangers. He would scream when anyone approached him, but found comfort in the arms of his foster mother. He was described as a strange child who was often bullied and had difficulty making friends. Even as Peter's behavior became more and more bizarre as the years went by, his foster mother defended him 
and eventually he was treated for his behavioral problems at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. While the treatment helped Peter cope somewhat, it was not entirely successful. At this point in time, Peter developed a fondness for wandering away from home and a love of the public transit system. He enjoyed admiring the physical structure of the city's streetcars and would venture around the city, a habit that left his foster parents full of worry. He started this behavior at the age of four. His walks around the city helped him to, quote, hide from other children, unquote, so that, quote, God would protect him. As Peter grew older, he exhibited more behavioral problems and the Maynards began to worry excessively. Their lives now revolved around Peter and appointments at the hospital were regular. Susan Maynard had a pet canary. Like most parents, she did not have any qualms about leaving her beloved bird at home in its cage with her son. Even though Peter had behavioral problems, he did not exhibit any violent tendencies and there was no need to worry that he would harm anyone or anything else. Peter's mind began to go to a dark place, one that was filled with violent fantasies and thoughts of destruction. When his mother returned home one day, she found her pet canary lifeless on the piano. What was even more bizarre was the ritualistic way in which the canary was displayed. Candles that were lit had been carefully placed around the dead bird. After his mother's discovery, Peter exhibited a personality trait that would remain with him for the rest of his life. He was becoming an habitual liar and he attempted to cover up his deed by blaming their pet dog for the death of the canary. As Peter's behavior progressed from odd to destructive, he became more and more isolated. Children continued to mock and bully him and he was terrified to be in their presence. He found safety and comfort when he isolated himself. However, this led to more destructive behavior. On more than one occasion, Peter destroyed furniture and his own clothing while left alone at home. The main yards, however, were even more intent on helping their son. It should be noted that Peter's strongest defender was Susan, who now devoted much of her life to saving the boy. The Maynards eventually took their son out of public school and enrolled him in private school. Unfortunately, this did not work out for Peter, who continued to isolate himself from the other children. His bizarre behavior escalated and now included uncontrollable twitching. He would deal with his stress by going on long bike rides. Peter's foster parents decided that it would be best for Peter to attend Sunnyside Children's Center, a school for children with behavioral and emotional problems. At this facility, Peter appeared to fit in, but something else was happening. As with most adolescents, Peter was becoming aware of his sexuality. This awareness mingled with emotional problems led to troubling behavior. Peter was caught in the act of fondling a young girl at the institution, and he also engaged in inappropriate activities with children. In addition, his loathing for children was becoming more apparent when, at the age of 11, he told a social worker who had taken him to the Canadian National Exhibition that, I wish a bomb would fall on the exhibition and kill all the children. When he was released from Sunnyside, it was with trepidation, as the staff thought that it was too soon for Peter to return home. 
He was ill prepared for the outside world. He was not bullied at Sunnyside and had overcome some of his awkwardness. But once again, the bullying commenced once he enrolled in high school. After a physical attack by some students, he was taken out of the school and enrolled in a private school where he remained until the fateful end of his academic career. Peter continued to take long bike rides in the city of Toronto. He also began to create an inner world of fantasy in which he was the leader of a fictitious gang he named the Winchester Heights Gang. Although awkward and a social outcast, he was able to find employment at Casa Loma, and by all accounts, he excelled as an employee. Peter's abnormal fantasies of children became entwined with his growing fascination with human anatomy. And in March of 1956, an opportunity arose that would promise to satisfy his yearnings. He had become acquainted with a young and very troubled 10-year-old girl. The girl told Peter that her father had been molesting her and that her mother blamed her for their impending divorce. She had no support from any adults and simply wanted to die. She enlisted Peter to help her fulfill her wishes. Peter was elated. Here was an innocent young girl wanting to escape her abusive reality and a sociopathic teenager willing to do the act for morbid fascination. Years later, he would recall, it was a turning point. I was already troubled with my fantasies and dreams. This 10 year old girl, I did have plans of killing her. I wanted to look at the arm, see how the muscles attaches to it. This was going to be a very thorough anatomical lesson. The planned murder quickly became a failed attempt, mainly because Peter was not skilled in the method of asphyxiation and the process of human dissection. Unable to kill the girl, he gave up. Also, the police went looking for Peter at his home once the girl's parents reported her missing. He had lost his first potential victim, but that did not deter him from seeking out other children to victimize. Ever the bike rider, he continued to explore Toronto on long trips around the city. It was his way of finding unsuspecting children and assaulting them. On the evening of Saturday, September 16, 1956, Irene Millette waited for her sons to return home. The family had spent the day in Toronto with their grandmother, who lived near the Canadian National Exhibition. During the day, three of the boys decided to go downtown and little Wayne stayed behind to play in his grandmother's front yard. Like most four-year-olds, Wayne was a curious child, and sometime during the day, he wandered away from his grandmother's front lawn and began to walk around the neighborhood. Wayne loved trains and made his way to the tracks near the exhibition grounds. Peter Woodcock had spent the day riding his bike around the city until he reached the wooded area. That area was in the exhibition grounds, and it was here that he met Wayne Millette. At the age of 17, Peter was already a seasoned pedophile and knew precisely how to coerce the child to get him to a more secluded place where he could assault him. Wayne eagerly told Peter that he loved trains and that he came to the tracks to see them. Peter loved trains too and used his interest in vehicles to gain the little boy's trust. 
Peter assured the child that they could share their fascination of trains together. Once Peter led the boy to an even more secluded area, Peter began to assault the child. Wayne Millette endured a vicious attack. He was kicked repeatedly and bitten several times on his legs. Peter had stuffed garbage down the child's throat. He also stripped Wayne naked to examine his body and then redressed him as the child lay dead on the ground. Following the murder, Peter approached a security guard and asked the man if dead bodies were ever found hidden in the bushes. He then proceeded to tell the security guard that he saw a young boy run out of the woods and that the boy resembled Peter himself. The man would later recall the strange boy on a bike who wore glasses. Wayne Millette's body was found a few hours after his murder. Because of the age of the victim and the way in which he was brutalized and assaulted, the police worked quickly to apprehend a suspect. Unfortunately, their suspect turned out to be an innocent teenager who went missing from his home for four days. After finding him hidden away under the veranda of his home, the police eventually tied the boy, whose name was Ronald Mowat, to the murder of Wayne Millette. Ronald was eventually convicted of manslaughter and incarcerated in the Guelph Reformatory. With the police far from being on his trail, Peter Woodcock was planning his next murder. Peter continued to ride his bike freely around the city. He enjoyed discovering neighborhoods in Toronto and was keen on venturing to uncharted territories. He found his way to Cherry Beach along the city's docks. This was the perfect place for his next crime. During the 1950s, Cherry Beach was not well-traveled and somewhat neglected. It was also known as a popular place for criminal activity. On the afternoon of October the 6th, 1956, Peter rode his bike to St. Lawrence Market and saw a nine-year-old boy named Gary Morris. Peter was easily able to entice the young boy to go with him. Gary sat on the crossbar of Peter's bike and they rode away from St. Lawrence Market to a deserted area of Cherry Beach. Peter then walked with Gary to the waterfront and attacked him. He took off Gary's clothes and examined his body. He then strangled the boy, rendering him unconscious. It was more than a week before Gary's body was discovered. Because he was believed to be a runaway, this had deterred the police investigation for a few days. When Gary's body was found, there were obvious signs of brutality. His liver had ruptured and he had bite marks on his neck. One witness came forward who told the police that they saw Gary ride away on a bike with a teenage boy who wore glasses. The lack of modern day forensics, in addition to problems with communication between the different police forces in Toronto at the time, enabled Peter to continue victimizing children. Before long, Peter was on the prowl again. It was only a few weeks following the murder of Gary when Peter assaulted and attempted to strangle a young girl to death. The girl survived a brutal attack and was able to describe the would-be murderer as a teenage boy on a bike who wore glasses. Carol Voice would spend the last day of her life playing with her friend Johnny. She had gone to Johnny's apartment building with her mother that afternoon 
and while her mother paid a visit inside of the complex, Carol and Johnny played outside with her friend. That afternoon, Peter Woodcock got on his bike and rode along Danforth Avenue where he saw Carol and Johnny. He approached the two children and started to talk to them about his bike. They both liked his bike and Peter asked the children if they wanted to go for a ride. Both children were eager to go on a new adventure. At first Peter wanted to take the small boy but then told Carol that he would take her instead. Carol rode on the bike's handlebar as the two made their way down the Danforth to a hidden area in the ravine. When Carol's mother returned to get her daughter, Johnny told her that Carol had left with a boy on a bike. The police were summoned and a large-scale search took place to find the missing child. Several witnesses had come forward. One had seen a teenage boy with glasses riding a bike with a young girl sitting on the handles. Another had seen a teenage boy riding his bike along the Danforth earlier that afternoon. By the time Carol's mother noticed that her daughter was missing, Peter had already ridden his bike to the Rosedale Ravine. Peter coerced Carol to walk to a secluded area near the Bloor Viaduct. The child would soon become Peter's next victim. His surprise attack started with strangulation until Carol fell into unconsciousness and then he forcefully poked her in her eyes. Peter then followed the same ritual as he had done before with his other victims. He stripped her naked and examined her body. After he had killed Carol, Peter returned to her body and kicked her in the head. Fearing that he would be caught, he got on his bike and quickly left the secluded area. However, just as he did after he murdered Wayne Millette, he approached a bystander after killing his victim. He told the man, if there's a murder down there, they'll try to blame it on me. He then sped away. When Carol's body was found near the Bloor Viaduct that evening, there were obvious signs of struggle and molestation. Carol had fought for her life. Her little hands were caked with mud and her fingernails were broken. Fragments of the killer's clothing were still clutched in her hands. Carol's friend Johnny was able to give the police a description of the teenage suspect. And since there were other individuals who had seen a teenage boy riding a bike in the area, the police had a good description. Newspaper headlines highlighted details about Carol's murder and the boy on a bike was believed to be responsible for the crime. Anyone resembling the description of the killer was suspect. A few teenage boys were stopped by police on the streets and questioned. Needless to say, the city was on edge, and many parents were terrified to let their children go outside to play. Overcome with grief, Carol's father pleaded with the killer to give himself up. During this time, the police were establishing a link between Peter Woodcock and Carol's murder. Officers had previously visited the main yard home after the 10-year-old girl who had asked Peter to kill her went missing. Her parents spoke to the police about Peter. This information was kept on file and the police suspected that Peter may have been involved in Carol's murder. On January 21st, 1957, Peter Woodcock was escorted out of his high school and subsequently charged with three counts of first-degree murder. Peter would give a vivid account of his crimes against children to the police. His recollection provided a look into the mind of a sadistic child predator. The first time this happened was in March. You already know the details about that, about the girl. And from then until now, I have actually attacked many children, even though I love children as a rule. I won't go into the number of cases, 
but we'll say there must have been about 11 or 12 of them before I met the girl. That is for this case. And I took her for a ride to the viaduct. And you fellows know about it now. You want to know how I subdued her, I suppose. Well, first of all, I choked her. This is very gruesome, I know. Then I stuck my fingers in her eyes. I don't know why I did that. Isn't it awful? As sadistic of a murderer that he was, Peter was also a coward. He feared that his mother would find out about his crimes, and he was also afraid of public humiliation. The City of Toronto would certainly be safe once Peter Woodcock would either hang or be locked up for good. The death penalty had not yet been abolished in Canada, so there was the chance that he would be hung if found guilty. Peter's trial was held in Old City Hall and on Thursday, April 11, 1957, Peter Woodcock's life would be spared. He was found not guilty on account of insanity and was sentenced to custody in the Toronto Psychiatric Hospital. Following his sentencing, Peter stayed at the Queen Street Asylum in Toronto and eventually was sent to Oak Ridge, a maximum security psychiatric institution. He soon became depressed and tried to injure himself by inserting wire into his genitals. Over time, Peter adapted to the routine at Oak Ridge and he seemed to relish in his surroundings. His depression diminished as his libido increased. Peter gained a reputation for having multiple intimate encounters with inmates. It seemed that Peter began to enjoy his new home. Oak Ridge was an interesting place. There were things going on in the institution that would come to light over the years. Questionable drug therapies were used, including LSD, to treat the inmates. LSD and speed were sometimes combined and used as a form of experimental therapy. Peter was subjected to these treatments. One could argue that Peter's eventual murderous behavior that would once again arise was brought on by these experimental treatments. Or maybe he was just destined to never develop a moral compass and human compassion. While incarcerated, Peter Woodcock legally changed his name to David Michael Kruger. Perhaps he saw this new identity as a new beginning of sorts, a way to erase his past and become a new man. Who knows what was going on through his head? What is apparent is that Peter Woodcock, now known as David Michael Kruger, was not a changed man, but a lifelong manipulator, liar, and killer. After spending over 30 years at Oak Ridge, some clinicians were convinced that David no longer needed to be in a maximum security facility. A review board concluded that the majority of the evidence, however, indicates that he, David, can be safely kept in a medium secure institution. The staff at Oak Ridge beg to differ. It is felt that Mr. Kruger continues to have deviant sexual thought fantasies and due to his coldness and lack of skills and his in-depth fantasy life that he would be dangerous to young members of society. One may question whether or not David's physical decline and advancing age also played a part in the review board's decision to transfer him to a medium security facility. He may have appeared to be quite harmless physically, and his poor eyesight 
and the fact that he was losing his hearing may have caused some to question if he was still capable of committing the same type of horrendous crimes that he committed in his youth. Regardless of warnings given by Oak Ridge staff, David was sent to Brockville Psychiatric Hospital located near the St. Lawrence River in Ontario. The staff at the Brockville Psychiatric Hospital was a lot more easygoing than the staff at Oak Ridge, and day passes were readily available for inmates who were no longer deemed to be dangerous to society. After Oak Ridge, life at Brockville must have seemed like a luxury hotel for David. David would accompany staff on day trips, and he was seen as a likable person. Eventually, David would go on an unsupervised outing with a former lover and former inmate named Bruce Hamill, who he met at Oak Ridge. Bruce Hamill was a free man after having been incarcerated for several years. He had been found not guilty due to insanity for stabbing a neighbor 36 times because, quote, she made my mother mad. The 21-year-old was sent to Oak Ridge in 1977 and then transferred to Brockville in 1978. It was at Brockville that staff prepared Bruce for his transition back into society. He was given day passes and was eventually released in 1983. As a free man with no criminal record for almost a decade, Bruce was eligible to accompany David Michael Kruger on his first day trip without Brockville staff. On July 13, 1991, Bruce arrived at Brockville to accompany David on his day trip. David planned to murder another Brockville inmate, Dennis Kerr, and Bruce was used as an accomplice. An article from the Toronto Star described the events that followed. They were supposed to get ice cream. Instead, the pair lured Dennis Kerr, a 27-year-old patient who had rebuffed Kruger's sexual advances, into the woods behind the hospital with a promise of a set of drums. Kruger had allotted 10 minutes of his three hour pass to killing Kerr, and then he and Bruce took turns molesting his corpse. They also stabbed Kerr's body more than 100 times. Kruger called the killing the thrill, the last hurrah, the final episode. After killing Dennis Kerr, David went into a police station and confessed. One of the officers who testified at David's trial stated that David revealed that he was aroused by the murder. Another witness also testified that David was so aroused after the killing that he couldn't keep his hands off himself in the Brockville hospital or the police lockup. Both David and Bruce were found not guilty by reason of insanity and sentenced once again to Oak Ridge. Neither one was ever released again. David Michael Kruger, formerly known as Peter Woodcock, remained in Oak Ridge. His only visitors were the occasional reporter. His adopted mother, who had stood by her son during his trial and subsequent incarceration, eventually stopped communicating. David never knew what happened to his foster family. On March the 5th, 2010, at the age of 71, David Michael Kruger passed away at Oak Ridge.
As with all murderers, David Michael Kruger permanently damaged the lives of many people. Ronald Mowat, whose real name is Ron Moffat, was wrongly convicted for the murder of Wayne Millett. He was subjected to abuse, drug therapy, and psychiatric sessions while incarcerated. Ron was released a year later, but he and his family had suffered. During an interview with the CBC's Morning North in 2018, Ron stated that, my parents lost everything. They were selling furniture to pay for my legal bills. Dennis Kerr's family filed a lawsuit against the hospitals involved and the Ministry of Health. They were awarded an undisclosed amount. And what about the infamous Oak Ridge? Well, the Institute became the subject of a lawsuit for its LSD experiments and allegations of torture. In 2001, a class action lawsuit was filed against the Ontario government, Dr. Elliot Barker and Dr. Gary Mayer that alleged human and civil rights violations. Oak Ridge was eventually shut down in 2014. I hope you found this case as interesting as I did. I will be posting more videos about Canadian crimes and mysteries. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to subscribe.